so last week, last week was shit. I suspected one reason I was so inadequate and lost is what was because I was tired, which is bullshit. So I'm doing this Saturday again, end of the week. That way I'm ahead, time-wise, timeline-wise, and I'm testing my theory. I think the reason, which I didn't even point out, I think, last week, was that I didn't plan at all. This week, I have plenty of notes. The first of which is in regards to paying attention. Something I've talked about before. Wait a minute. It feels weird. Now, I guess I'm doing this weekly. Actually weekly. In the past, since I was... Well, it's my second week in a row doing it Saturday. So there's actually seven days that happen in between. In the past, I would do them willy-nilly, anytime, usually late. And so what would happen is that sometimes 10 days would go by and I would come back and it would feel weird and unusual. And then sometimes three days would go by because I was catching up. And so it felt more familiar. Right now I'm listening to myself speak and it feels a bit strange. So I suppose after a while I'll get used to doing it every week. And that would be good. The first thing I'll talk about was paying attention. Two weeks ago, I believe, or last week, last week there was a fight, a UFC fight, and the guy who wasn't supposed to lose lost in 33 seconds. And I've bet on many fights in the past, always, always lost, I won once. And I realized every time I'm not paying attention to a fight that's going to happen and I'm not really invested, I don't really think about it, that's when an upset ha happens. So it made me think about how paying, paying attention, the importance of paying attention, essentially. And perhaps it's also a sign that I need to stop betting. If every time I don't bet is the time I should have bet, and vice versa, might be a sign that I just need to give up. Don't bet. Is my point. A guy at work told me he bet 200 pounds and won one, one grand. I think to myself, and Bernie does that regularly. So I guess some people somehow are more prone to get lucky. I saw a video on Instagram. Well, it was just an image of a guy and a text that said, my boss just threw away. There was a pile of application applications for, for a job. He threw away half the pile and he said, we don't want unlucky people working for us. And I thought that was hilarious and, dare I say, very, some, some, somehow smart. I don't know why it's so stupid, but I like the idea. Wow. Wow, freedom. 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 Second thing I want to talk about. So I realized after yes, last week's episode that I did have a lot of things I wanted to mention. I saw a video. It ties into many different subjects. I saw a video of Logan Paul talking about just an offhand comment about his relationship. Now, most people will know that because he's fighting Dylan Dennis tonight, I believe, because of that... Dylan Dennis, as a way to promote the fight and to get into Logan Paul's head, has used his fiance, Logan Paul's fiance, his girlfriend. And you might also know that she is a notoriously promiscuous woman, and she's not shy about it. Anyways, in a podcast, he was talking about, I believe, probably things related to sex. And then he made a comment that I thought was very untasteful. Is that a word, untasteful? Probably it is now, if it wasn't before. A very untasteful comment. And a few things. First, I asked people what they thought about this idea of saying, talking about one's sexual relationship in excessive detail. And he wasn't he wasn't that that detailed, but it was still too much. And it seems everyone agrees you shouldn't do that. And so it made me think about, furthermore, kind of digging deeper into the subject about his character, Logan Paul. 
he's an awful role model, I think. Terrible role model. I don't know the details of all his stunts and his mistakes. We all know about the forest thing, which was in bad taste. I know there's a crypto scam thing as well. He, he's just a terrible role model. And it made me go into the subject of high value men. That's a buzzword nowadays. The manosphere and the red pill community talk about it a lot. What is a high value man? And you look at a guy like Logan Paul. And in appearance, he is a high value man. I saw him doing his pre public workout for the, 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 the fight. He's really tall in extremely good shape. He probably takes you know, performance and haunting drugs. Who knows? But he is athletically gifted. He's tall. He's not especially ugly. He can do the splits. He's very athletic. He's very successful. He is, he is charismatic because he's just so used to talking in public. He has all these attributes, right? Which leads one to believe that he is a high value man, right? People in the manosphere and these people who talk about high value men, men mostly, wealth, being able to take care of people financially, being in good shape. And then smaller things like being articulate, being able to speak, to express yourself, being ambitious, all these things. He, ha he has all these things. But I don't think he's a high value man. I think people talk too much about the surface level things. What matters is what's at the bottom, the structure. And one man that champions this idea of the high value man more than anyone is Andrew Tate. And he talks a lot about the surface level stuff. He does talk about the, the foundation of what a high value man is supposed to be, but I don't think he talks about it enough. Or I think it's less interesting when he does it. And so the message that gets clipped and shared around media, social media, is more about the surface level things. So I try to think about what's my definition of a high value man. And so it's not about what's on the surface. I also started watching videos from a lady called Sadia Khan, I believe, who talks about similar subjects from her perspective. And there are so many points to be made on this subject. This idea of if a woman goes for a high value, a high value man, right, because of what's on the surface, if that's all she appreciates, what's on the surface, right, then she's shallow, it's no good. We all know that. The value of having the wealth is not the wealth, it's how you acquired it. So I try to boil it down to two things, which I believe make a high value man, in my opinion. And so we're talking about essential things, a person's character, things at the very, a very root of a person. And I'm trying to think of them right now, and I can remember one. Okay, I can remember the two. How do I say this? You don't, you can come up with countless examples. You don't pick a car just because of its appearance, just because it looks good, just because it moves fast. You think about, is it reliable? You know, you, th you need to think about what's under the surface at all times for everything, always. It's idea if you don't read a book by its, you don't choose a book, but you don't judge a book by its cover. A book you know, has a magnificent cover that doesn't make you, 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 you find a 500 page book you don't look at the cover and think, wow, that looks like a great book. You're not going to invest the hours based on the cover. That's what this idea of don't judge a book by its cover means. What is it about? Who wrote it? Is it someone with credentials? Is the summary interesting? Is the idea of the book interesting? Is the conflict that happens in it interesting? You know, the, you look at the reviews, perhaps. All these things, right? The cover doesn't matter. Anyone can make a great cover. Not anyone, but anyone with skills can produce a great looking cover. What matters is the actual book. If you're going to invest yourself in this, right? So a high value man, you can talk all day long about the surface level things. He's got money. He's in good shape, blah, blah, blah. 
but why does he have this money? I remember I saw a video a few weeks ago of a guy on Instagram once again, a uh, short reel, an Italian guy, and the interview, interview, the interviewer comes to him and asks him, asks him, what do you do for a living, blah, blah, blah. Turns out the guy is extremely wealthy and all he does is party, right? And by all means, on the surface, he looks like a high value man. He's, he looks like he's in shape. He's got the wealth. He, daddy's money. His daddy's happy paying for him. He's not a high value man. Now, he might look more like a high value man than someone like me, for example, who's just working a nine to five, blah, 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 all this, because we don't have the status. There's a word for it, status. Things that show status. The status objects, the status. Oh, not status signifiers. Whatever. We don't have the things that tell you that perhaps we are high value men, right? Once again, he has the wealth. High value men, apparently they need to have the wealth. How did he get it? He didn't get it. He didn't acquire it. So he doesn't have the attributes of the high value man. He only has the, the status fucking, there's a word for it. Symbols, status symbols. He has the money. He has this, he has that. What matters is what's at the root. You find a person, it's just like a woman. You find a woman, for a woman, many, some of the things that make a woman high value from, from a man's perspective is beauty. That's something that attracts us. Now, you find a beautiful woman, you start talking to her, she's, you don't vibe, you don't connect on an emotional level, emotional level, you don't have the same interests, you don't, maybe she's not nice, maybe she's not very intelligent, maybe she's whatever. The beauty doesn't matter, right? So that's the surface. So this guy is not a high value man. Having money doesn't make you a high value man. The two things I would say that characterize a high value man is stoicism first, which is also a buzzword nowadays, and ambition. I think these are the two. And I look at stoicism, and I'm going to use it as an umbrella term for many things. I haven't read, what is it, Aristotle's stuff. My understanding of it essentially is strength, stoicism. The definition is something like the ability to not show pain and suffering and to control oneself, self-control. Once again, I use stoicism as the kind of umbrella word. It means many things amongst what it means amongst the many things is strength, strength of character. Right. That's one. So I would say stoicism is like being a rock. That's your foundation. You have this, you have discipline as a man. You can control your, your emotions. All these things. You're strong. Stoicism. Now, in order to become successful, to have the wealth, to be in good shape, to be intelligent, educated, to be kind and caring, you need that base of strength that I, I associate to stoicism. You need that. And on the other hand, another thing you need, because that's not enough, if, you, if, all, you, if all you have is stoicism, you're a rock, you're static. That's not enough. You find a guy who's stoic, who's strong, blah, 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 all this. That's not enough. You need, you also need ambition, I think. Ambition is like water. Ambition is this desire to become more, right? Ambition, um, stoicism is this strength and ambition is the desire to use it and to grow and to be. So ambition is like water, as I said, it's adaptability. Desire for growth, to be wanting to be more. If you're not growing, you're dying. That's what ambition is. So you find this guy who has all the wealth. Does he have the stoicism, right? He didn't need it to acquire the wealth because it was given to him. Does he have the ambition? Clearly doesn't because he's not doing anything with the money he was given, right? So you, if you find someone who was given wealth, they may have these things. They may want to use them, the wealth they were given to for greater things. We have a guy who comes to the restaurant where I work and he's the son of some very rich guy, a very rich man. And I asked my colleagues who know him you know, better than me, what does he do with the money? Why? What does he do? He just comes to the restaurant. He just parties. He just has fun. Has fun. As far as we know, he doesn't do anything productive with it. And so he can come in with the rest to the restaurant with beautiful women. You know, he, he has all the status symbols of a high value man. 
And I don't know... We'll just use him as an example. I don't know actually what he does with his money in detail at all, of course. But to me, if you're in this position, you should be, and you're given wealth, you should be known to, you should be known as a person who creates things. You're given wealth, then if you are high value, high value man, you have ambition. And so you're given this wealth, you didn't work for it, you're going to work for something else. There's this video of Donald Trump funny video saying he got a small loan of a million dollars right now my first reaction was you fucking can't right a small loan of a million dollars that's nothing but well, he's a billionaire today he became president he achieved many he achieved many things so he's not defined by by that first assistance he was given that was enormous he had ambition and so he made it more and so that makes one a high value man i'm not talking specifically about donald trump but so i thought about these two things and how role models nowadays, for men specifically, are not high-value men. Some are ambitious. You look at a guy like Logan Paul. Ambitious, for sure. He has this desire to grow, to create things, to make more money and exploit people. But still, he has this ambition. And he's flexible, like water, right? He does WWE boxing exhibitions. These are beautiful things, I think. You look at a man who has all this wealth, and this stability in his life. And he decides to put his health in harm's way to do this, these things which are scary. So that's ambition. That's definitely something people should look at him and aspire to. But the stoicism, I don't think he has it. I don't think he has the strength. The comment he made on the podcast to me is a show of weakness. And the many things he's done in the past. And something as small as crying on camera. I think is disgusting. As a man. To me, you lose a lot of points, so to speak, when you do that. Why? I had this talk with my brother recently, this idea, talk, uh, crying on camera. And then we talked about maybe when some people that we know or some celebrities did it, it was, it, it worked, so to speak. It didn't make us think less of them. So I talked about Jordan Peterson, for example, seeing him cry repeatedly and how that made me lose some appreciation for him and for his stoicism and his strength. We talked about so him, a bunch of other people. And at first I thought, well, I'm not going to go into the examples we use, but when this happened and this man, celebrity, by all, by all accounts strong, did cry in public, it made us think even more of him. Because I was brave. That's what I thought at first. And then I thought about it more. And I came to the conclusion that no. It's never okay. It's never okay. To cry in, in, on camera. Especially. Or even in public for a man. You lose, you lose points when you do that. And I'll go back to Andrew Tate. That's, it, that's the example I used. With my brother. I don't think he would ever. Be seen crying. On camera. Ever. I don't think he would that would I don't think that's an option. On one hand, I think that he has the stoicism to control his emotions and to not cry. On the other hand, it's online videos. If you feel like crying, you cut that out. You don't have to show it. No one is forced to cry in on on the web. It's all online. You don't have to so people do it on purpose. You look at a guy like Jordan Peterson. Who's been seen crying. in Online. He had a choice. He did. He 100% had a choice. Now once again I'll go back to the example of Andrew Tate. And I said if his brother died. His brother seems to be the closest person he has. Clearly. Right? What if his brother died? Surely he would cry. So one is I, I, I don't think he would even consider the idea of being seen crying in public or in a video. And two, if he's doing a video talking about it, for example, and he feels the emotions rushing to the surface, he wouldn't share that. He would cut that out. I, I truly look at him as a paragon of kind of masculinity. He's not perfect. There are things I disagree with. But when I look at him, I think that would never happen, right? And so some people might say it's unhealthy. The idea that 
Some people might say he's an un unhealthy example because he wouldn't do that. And once again, we're talking about crying in front of the world, right? So, so then I think to myself, why do people do that? Because it's a risk. Why are people seen crying? Why are strong men allow, allowing their, their image to be affected by that? What do they gain? And the first thing I thought was sympathy. Right? If you cry, in, if you cry in front of everyone because you're sad, someone died, you gain sympathy, which is weak. If you're doing it for sympathy, you're a fucking pussy. Why do you want to gain people's sympathy? That's a weak thing to do. And you know, obviously, it's to benefit them in the long run. Oh look, he cried. He's a man, but he's so strong he'll cry in front of everyone, right? That's to that's to get a ben to get benefit out of it, right? So that that would be the intelligent option. Oh, I'm gonna cry, and it, it might just happen in the moment, but you think to yourself, "Fuck it, I'll just cry now," and or you or it's premeditated. I'll, I'll I'll talk about the subject and I'll cry, and I'll gain gain sympathy from that. One, and some people might say, "No, you cry in public because." you'll look even stronger, which I don't get. Mm. You don't have to cry in public ever as a man. And once again, I'm talking about as a man because I am a man. That's the experience of the world that I know. It's a very complex thing, but I do believe this to be true. And two, so sympathy, and two, it's because they couldn't stop themselves. But even, I suppose, in a, in a live event, that could happen, you can't stop yourself. Once again, I go back to this idea of stoicism, and ambition. And if, as a man, you've worked on yourself enough and you're strong enough, then that shouldn't happen. Right? So what I'm saying is that either they did it on purpose to gain sympathy, which is a weak thing to do, or they couldn't control themselves. They couldn't control the tears. And so that is also a show of weakness. So I've talked about a few of the things I wanted to talk about. But I'll go back to this idea of male role models nowadays. And this idea of high value man just e e and role model are in many ways the same. Just something that you, you can look up to and aspire to. As a man, you want to be a high value man and you want to be someone people can aspire to be. The problem is that there's the surface and that there's what's underneath the surface. I also think, I also think about this idea of people just as the, I think about the power of Stoicism and how there, there are many people, there's the 27 Club, artists who died at 27. And we glorify this idea of having it on the surface, being able to be an amazing artist, just to make great work for the world. We glorify that and this idea that if the foundation is weak in a weird way, so the ambition is very strong, but the foundation is of the... The stoicism is weak. The rock, there's no rock. There's only water. And what comes out of this is you create this great art and then you die because you didn't have the foundation to support yourself and through that experience. You, know, you can think of Amy Winehouse, Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, because I think I, I believe they're all part of the 27 Club. Amy and Hendrix and a bunch of other people. And we think, wow, they died so young. They're they made this amazing work and we, we act like it's the only way this could have happened. The only way they could have made such great work is if they were completely out of control and it killed them in a way. I think that's bullshit. I think we're glorifying bad role models. I don't think they are good role models. I think you don't want to have too much of one thing. And I don't believe, I don't subscribe, subscribe to this idea that it was the only way for them to, to create this great work. If they were stronger, and strength is relative in terms of there's a strength you possess and then there's a situation you're in and how much that tests your strength. So you, you might be extremely strong, but if you're in a position that makes you very vulnerable, if you're being attacked from all sides, then it doesn't matter how, well, even if you're very strong, you can break. Just like if you're very weak, and you're in a situation that's not terribly difficult for others, you might also break. So it's not a case of the strength they had inside of them necessarily. It's about the combination of the two. Anyways, 
I think that we glorify these people who are just bad role models, essentially. I think we glorify bad role models. I think someone who's able to create beautiful work and great art doesn't have to be perfect. They don't have to be completely put together. But someone who's able to create great art and at the same time have the foundation underneath to support themselves and have the longevity, I think that's a good role model. So, role models, you know, for men, the most popular people you can look, you can find on the internet, people like Logan Paul, especially for young men, are terrible role models. Because they promote this idea that you can have just one of the two things and succeed, right? On the surface, you're successful, but underneath it, if you're hurting people, if you're impacting people in a negative way through your audience, you know, it adds up, it doesn't add up to a positive impact. You know, going back to Andrew Tate, who's definitely made comments and said things that have had negative impacts, but most of it seems to be positive. I am a reasonably intelligent, you know, adult male, so when I consume his content, I understand that I can take what's positive and what's useful and reject what isn't. If you're a kid, sure, you might listen to the wrong parts, focus on the wrong parts, and that might have a negative, a negative effect. But I look at him, right, this idea of stoicism and of ambition. He's extremely ambitious, it's obvious. And I've looked at a lot of his content from when he was much younger. He's always had this ambition, right? So that's a thing you, you want to look up to. And he's extremely successful. He's also very strong, very stoic. He went, he was in jail for three months. And he admits that it has impacted him. And yet he's still in control of his image, of his world, of his message, right? Put Logan Paul in, in jail for 90, for 90 days. And you'll see how, sure, he has the ambition. He, his water is adaptable. But the stoicism, the strength, I think he would break like a, like a chopstick. So all this to say that perhaps Andrew Tate is the only good role model for men that exist. I don't know. I looked up to LeBron James growing up, right? Extremely ambitious, strong, disciplined, blah, 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 all this shit. But I think I've seen multiple instances, instances of him being fake that made me feel like, sure, he has this surface level stuff. Right, And I even talked about how I'm sure he has his life put together quite well and that impacts him on the court. But at his core, I don't think... I think there are weaknesses which I don't... which make me look up to him less. You know, I go back to Andrew Tate always. I look at him and he's in control. He's strong. When he speaks, he's in control of his life, of his message, of his image. He's in control. I can't imagine him crying if someone died in his family in public and using that, right? LeBron James did it. He didn't have to. But he did cry in public for, I believe, Kobe Bryant's death, right? Why did he do it? He didn't have to. And he seems... He doesn't seem to be totally genuine, right? Right? And, once, and it's, these things are very complicated because he's owned, in a way, LeBron James. He can't say what he wants. He can't do what he wants. But the result of that is... The result is that he comes off fake a lot of the time. You go back to Andrew Tate. He's been cancelled from everything. He can express himself 100% without censoring himself. And that's not a small thing. LeBron James' image is partly him, partly a creation and you feel that. You feel that he is acting in a way to keep his spot, just like Logan Paul. He can't stray from the narrative too much, right? Mr. Tate, he is his own boss to a degree, and he doesn't have to fake anything or lie. Seems like a genuine person, right? And if you're 
if you are you have the qualities of being stoic of being in control of being strong and understanding that if you're lying if you're faking you're damaging your own self you're hurting yourself you're hurting the, your reality 50 cents has a line hate a liar more than i hate a thief because a thief is after my salary a liar is after my reality lying is poison lying is underrated how bad it is i learned that through experiences no lie is a good lie sure sure sometimes you might have to lie you go to an extreme example you're in danger for example and you have to lie right that's but that's not the same thing uh, i don't even know if that's a lie to me a lie you know when you're lying you know you've made a mistake you, you can feel it it eats at you the big the big lies just they create c c cancer and a lie is not obviously a lie is not just saying something you can lie to yourself and your behavior right and that's something another thing that that's something i get from tate he never seems to be lying to be faking anything and that adds to to his strength you, know, you look at public figures actors sports athletes athletes period these people are owned to a degree they can't say what they want they can't do what they want and as a result they have to fake faking is part of who they are if they want to be lebron james the character the personality the multi-millionaire basketball player if you want to stay that then you have to sugarcoat it you have to act to a degree if you want to stay Andrew Tate you don't have to because the mainstream has rejected him he doesn't have to appear a certain way to stay where he is stoicism and ambition I think that's what makes a high value man that's why you don't have to be wealthy to be a high value man you don't have to be you know, you don't have to be in crazy shape to be a high value man. If you're working on this base, this rock of stoicism, of being strong, of controlling your emotions, of being truthful. And if you, and if you are a naturally ambitious person or it's something you're working on and you have desires to grow every day, you're thinking about growing, improving yourself in every aspect of your life. If you have these and you're working on these, then the wealth, the success, these things are going to come. But you're not going to become a high value man when these things arrive. You are a high value man if you have these principles and you're working on them. And I don't have the wealth or the success. And I don't think I am a high value man at the moment. But I understand that my goal never will be success, wealth, being in the best shape possible. That's never the goal. It's the journey. It's to solidify this rock, my foundation, to control myself, my emotions, to be honest. And it is to... I suppose if you want to solidify the rock, what do you do to the water? It's to become more fluid, I suppose. And to remain fluid. Fluid? Fluid sounds weird, huh? Flexible, right? It's to become... To be flexible, to be adaptable, to have a desire to, to grow, to never settle. You know, that's the idea at the moment. I just thought about it a few days ago on the spot. I'm sure I'm missing some things. Usually things go in threes. I only have two right now. But I think it works pretty well. I think if you look at someone, for, go back to Logan Paul, for example. You look at Logan Paul and you think to yourself, he's a high value man, right? But then imagine, but then can you be a, a high value man, wealthy, successful, in great shape, but also be a sociopathic, selfish asshole? No, you can't. The two are mutually exclusive. You can't be both. If you are the high value man, then you have the stoicism and the self-control and the self-consciousness to not go around hurting people, to not go around having a terrible impact, to not go around selling this drink that they're selling that has copious amounts of whatever, caffeine or whatever, just this poison, right? You can't be the high-value man and not care about destroying people's lives for profit, right? That's a, a, a fundamental flaw in character. Right? 
Because you, you don't become the... Some people are that person who doesn't care about people. I don't know if he, if he is an actual sociopath and doesn't care, or if through his desire to... Through his ambition and his desire to grow, because it is an extremely lucrative, successful business they've created, he and KSI. I don't know if through that, he just learned that you have to make sacrifices along the way. I don't know. But... You know, the surface things are not the thing. If you have the attributes and you've worked on them to get there, that's what the thing is. I hope one day I'll be able to express myself in a more compendious way, as Mr. Tate likes to, to say. Okay, now I'm going to go to my notes. I've come to the conclusion that this needs to change. I've gotten comfortable with the idea of speaking to, speaking to the camera now. It doesn't bother me in any way. Once again, I'm saying this because when I started, I was not comfortable at all. At all. It was very scary. I'm not there yet. But I'm comfortable with talking to this camera in this room, in this specific situation. Right? That's I am comfortable there. So I... I would not be comfortable talking to a camera in public. One thing that I, when I was thinking about becoming more fluent and more articulate and more com confident in general, saw a video talking about how you should vlog. And that's terrifying. The idea of being somewhere in public talking to a camera, I just feel so stupid and so self-conscious. So I need to shake things up and start I need to find a way to do this in a different setting where I'm less comfortable now that's one way I can improve this and make it more useful take inspiration from Casey Neistat yeah so I'm always sitting oh, I'm always sitting maybe I should do one where I'm able to walk around in different locations, an interview. An interview would be an, an interview actually might be the natural step up. One thing I've learned about improve self improve just improvement in general is that I always want to jump too many steps at once. It's perfectly fine to take tiny steps. It's something I, I've talked to Ty about in terms of working out. She told me that her family is trying to change their diet to improve their health. And the way she explained it to me is that they just abruptly decided, okay, that's a new diet. We eat this now. We don't eat all that shit. We just eat this. And that doesn't work. It, it, ne it doesn't work. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to become the person who eats healthy. I think that's the best way to think about it. And once again, I can articulate these ideas. Doesn't mean that I apply them well. But to me, if you're trying to, if you're trying to be someone who wakes up at 5 a.m., and works out, right? Not even wakes up at 5 a.m. Let's make it more simple. You want to be the... You think that you want to get in shape. You think that's the goal. I want to be in shape. That's not the goal. The goal is you want to be a person because being in shape is not an end goal in terms of... Being in shape is not an end goal. You're not going to be in shape. As in, it's not going to happen overnight. And also, once you're in shape, you have to stay in shape. That's the That's the... You think it's the hard part. It's not the hard part because once you're in shape, you learn to enjoy it and you have a process if you do it well. But the goal is to become... Because w working out regularly, exercising, is good for your health. If you if you don't eat for a few... What, is it two weeks? Something like that? You die. If you don't drink for a week, or something like that, you die. If you don't sleep for 10 or 11, 12 days, you die, right? And so you think, if I I've never exercised, it's not going to kill me. No, no. What happens if you don't exercise is that it doesn't take a week, two weeks, a month. It might take decades, but you are dying slowly. Many, if you don't sleep enough, right? If you don't sleep for, for two weeks, you die. But if you don't sleep enough, you're just shortening your lifespan. It's just happening more incrementally. And there are many things like that. You know, at the top, you, you'll have, I suppose, drinking water. That's one of the things. Breathing. If you don't breathe, you die. If you don't breathe for however long, a few minutes, you die, right? So you know you need to breathe every day, all the time. You need to breathe. You don't even think about it, you just breathe. 
We're all breathers out here. All humans were breathers, right? We've, all, we've always been breathers since we were born. And to this day, we are breathers. That's just something we do. We don't think about it. Now, we all drink water. Some people less than others. But that's something we do. It takes a bit more thinking to drink water than it does to breathe. We all, we all understand we need to drink or we're going to die. We all eat, right? We all eat because we understand if we don't eat, we're going to die. It's just a habit of ours. We all eat. We are eaters. We're breathers. We're drinkers. We're, we're, we're eaters. And then we all sleep, right? We should all exercise as well. Once again, it's not going to kill you as quickly as not breathing, but it is going to kill you regardless, just more slowly, right? So when you think about, I want to get in shape, that's not what you're thinking. You want to integrate this habit, which is healthy for you. You want to be a person that exercises because it's healthy for you. You're a person that who eats, you're a person who breathes. You want to be a person who exercises because that's the optimal way to live your life, right? So your goal is not to find a program that's going to get you your six packs in six weeks, this or that. You want to be a person who exercises. You want to change who you are fundamentally. You want to be a person who exercises, right? So to do that, don't brutalize yourself. Start as slow as necessary. The guy who's in extremely good shape, one day he had to do his first push-up, assuming he's someone who does push-ups. Let's say one day he had to do his first push-up, second, third. Maybe it took him a week to do his first thousand push-ups. Maybe it will take you a month, two months. But he had to do his first push-up in order to become a person who exercises. He had to start somewhere. Now you think to yourself, you know, if you, if you think to yourself, I need to do a hundred push-ups the first day, you're going to discourage yourself. You're going to, it's not going to work. Just like I have, there are countless examples. When I arrived in the UK, I didn't speak English. I didn't think to myself, okay, I need to be able to speak, speak English upon arrival or after a week or after two weeks, right? I didn't think that. For the first few weeks, I thought nothing was happening. I was getting, I was scared. I thought it's never going to happen. I'm never going to learn. I'm not learning. I, I still don't speak English. It's been weeks. It's been months. I don't speak English. And then I don't know how, when. One day I, I was just able to communicate and slowly but surely I... I am a person who speaks, who speaks English now. Not very good at articulating, but I am a person who speaks English. And it was a very slow pro process. And, you know, I was 12. Someone who arrives in the UK with the goal, you know, a 30-year-old man who's learned Spanish, Italian, who speaks a bunch of languages, arrives in the UK with the goal to learn English. He doesn't speak English. He wants to learn English. He has, he has firstly, naturally, he's better than I was. He has this goal. He's done it before. He understands how. He's going to learn English faster than me, right? But I don't think to myself, okay, some guy can learn English in a month. It's been a month. I don't speak English. What the fuck? It's never going to happen. No, you don't think that way. It doesn't matter. Think about yourself. You want to be a person who exercises. Once again, you don't want to get in shape in six weeks. You don't want this. You don't want that. You want to be a person who exercises. I'm going to be able to speak English for the rest of my life. You want to be a person who exercises for the rest of their lives. Just get started. As slow, you do a push-up every other day in the morning at the same time. You do a push-up. Once that's too easy, you do two. You do three. Just incrementally increase. There's a word for it. The word is... The word is... Load. Something. Something load. Overload? Progressive overload right? At the end of the day, you'll get to your destination. But so that's what I was saying to my, to Ty, because her parents are slowly giving up on the diet. You don't just change the diet. I'm slowly getting back to my diet, eating once a day, not eating at any other point, eating this meal, and my approach is, at the moment, I'm not doing it. I'm do at the moment, I eat junk food here and there, and then I eat my, my meal. But I have a plan. The plan is, I eat more and more during that meal every day. And eventually, I'll, be, I'll get enough calories in that one meal that I won't be hungry for the rest of the day. But I didn't just one day say, all right, 
I'm gonna force myself not to eat junk food, not to eat, not to snack at some points of the day and eat this huge meal in, at 6 p.m. I didn't say that. I'm gradually working towards it to be a person who eats one meal. I'm trying to integrate this habit into my identity, right? People rarely talk about it in those terms when they talk about these workout programs, these diets. You're not trying to try, the, you're not trying this thing for fun. You're not trying this thing to get a six pack. You're not trying this thing so that you can be healthy for a week. You're trying to integrate this habit in, into you to become that person. That's what you're trying to do. So from that standpoint, if it takes you a year to become a person with a healthy diet, if it takes you a year to be a person who exercises regularly, if you're 25, if it takes you a year, from the age of 26 onwards, that's who you are. So that's much more valuable than let me get into in, in shape into, in six weeks. And sure, some people are able to do it, but not everyone. Some people need to understand that it's going to take the time it's going to take. But the outcome is that you become that person. So that's something I've realized recently about this idea of wanting to change is that you have to accept that, once again, if your goal is to be in good shape, if you're 50, if you're, si if you're 40, if you're 50, once you integrate that habit into your life, that's who you are. So if it takes you half a year but you get there that's what matters if you're trying to do it in six weeks boom you got the six packs after six pack after six weeks and now you feel like i feel miserable i don't do this that's not that's not the way to go so progressive overloads one has to accept that it may take a long time but you have to work towards it you have to be committed but you have to accept that you can't brutalize yourself uh, again, I'll say it again. If it takes you a year, after that year, that's who you are. You are a person who exercises. Right? Why do people keep, why do people think, oh, it needs to happen in six weeks. I need to have my six pack in six weeks. Because if you br brutalize yourself like that, it's more like doing a challenge. Right? It's You have a goal. The goal is to get your six pack. What happens once you have the six pack? Whereas if your goal is to become the person who exercises, then once you have integrated that habit, the day after you have to exercise. Now you're a person who exercises. So the day after you're, you will, you will exercise. You're not going to think, okay, I've become a person who exercises. What next? No. Now you are a person who exercises. So tomorrow you're going to exercise. And for weeks to come and months to come and years to come, you're going to do that. And once again, I've compared this exercising to eating and drinking and all these things, drinking water, because I believe it should be something that is integrated into people the same way. When you're a kid, your parents, they'll teach you, you'll learn to speak. You'll understand that you need to eat regularly, blah, blah, blah. Those are instincts even. But exercising is, is something that gets neglected. And exercising is paramount to our health. So it shouldn't be neglected. If, if through your childhood and through growing up, exercising wasn't integrated into your identity, if eating healthy wasn't integrated to you, into your identity, that is a form of neglect. Likely, their, your parents weren't taught that. And so you think that exercising is this thing that some people do, some people don't. People with the strong will do it. Others don't do it. No. You were taught to speak. You learned to walk. You learned these things. But you weren't taught that you need to exercise regularly. You just need to relearn that and to understand that it is not a goal. You're not trying to get a six-pack. No. You are supposed to be a person who exercises. You are supposed to be a person who loves themself, themselves enough to eat healthy. That's who you're supposed to be. And through many things, through many circumstances, obstacles, blah, 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 that was taken away from you. The reason you don't eat healthy is because you don't care about yourself enough. When you eat unhealthy, you're kidding yourself. You're making yourself feel like shit. If you don't exercise, you feel weak. 
So once again, when people advertise these programs of get a six pack in six in six weeks, that's bullshit. That's a money grab. You know, right? Because they talk about it in terms of get the thing, the six pack. And they don't talk about it in terms of you are supposed to be a person who exercises. That's supposed to be part of who you are, but you don't. So how can you become that person? They don't talk about it in those terms. It's always get this fucking goal, look at this picture of this guy with a six pack and become that. Get that. You know, get that. Get it. The six pack. You're trying to get the six pack. They don't tell you you're trying to be like that person. You're trying to integrate this habit into your being. No, 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 no. Oh, another. I also came to the realization. I completed a questionnaire recently where I was asked about things that I reproach. How do you use this term in English? Reproach. I reproach my parents for many things, right? We all do. No one's perfect. That's just the way it is. And in understanding the mistakes they made, I understand why I am the way I am and what I need to fix. It's not a case of, ah, you did this, you did that. No, this happened. Therefore, I am this way. Therefore, I need to do this. It's problem solving. But one thing I, I realized recently when I completed this well, afterwards, I completed the questionnaire and I wrote down things that are, that I repro that I reproached my parents, mistakes they made, and how it affected me. And I came to the realization only a few days ago that one thing they gave me, which is invaluable, and that I am realizing through many revelations, I'm using it in terms of just learning things about people that I didn't know, colleagues at work people that I know, through learning things about them, I realized that something my parents gave me, which is invaluable. For example, they didn't instill in me this idea that exercising should be part of who I am. They didn't. My father, in the last five years, has come to that realization for himself. He, re he exercises regularly now and he feels good about it. And that's new for him, right? But one thing that I realized recently is that they gave me something invaluable which I never thought about. And I'm seeing that partly, or partly based on my current relationship. And I would use it as a reproach almost. And it's the ability to love. When I was asked about how I would characterize my parents, how I would describe them, or how I would describe how they were towards me and what they gave me. For example, I reproached my father for not instilling in me this idea that working out is vital. Not instilling in me this idea that as a man, I need to be stoic, strong, disciplined. I reproached that. He was my father. And that's what I will instill in my, my children. And that's what I believe a father should do. That's part of his responsibility for his son to teach that he needs to be strong. He needs to be disciplined. He needs to get his life in order to get rid of the bullshit so that he can be strong. And I do reproach my dad for that. And as a result, I reproach him for being almost exceedingly loving. As in... He gave me all this love and building your children up and making them strong is a form of loving. But I reproach him for being too nice in a way and too loving and also characterize my mother as being very loving. And I don't, and I also reproach her for that because it made her baby us too much and protect us too much. And it made our, uh, our, it made us, my brother and I especially, 
very insular and reclusive in a way, the way we reacted to her love. But I realized recently that the number one thing that they gave me is this ability to love. And what does the note? What else does the note say? Because I'm not so. Yeah, I, I got very emotional when I thought about that. That they, they showed me. Oh, I was listening to. I think I was listening to some podcast, and it was mentioned this idea that people who have who are people who are broken in the deepest recesses of their soul, who are kind of who are lost and who are unable to love, it's because they didn't get their parents' love. And I thought, wow, that's something I never lacked. That's something I never thought about. Because it was, I took it for granted that my parents, both of them, my father, my mother, even my David, my stepdad and my stepmothers, but especially those three, my dad, my mother and, my, and David, gave me love. I never lacked that. And I think, I think that's quite rare. I'm realizing that it's quite rare that I have this base, this foundation where I never needed to compromise myself or I never felt unloved. And what they were arguing in the podcast, as far as I remember, was this idea that it breaks people. Really, in the deepest parts of who they are, if they are not loved by their parents, it's like at the very base of who they are, it just breaks something. If you're not loved by your parents, it has this immense effect on people. And I'm realizing that, sure, they had their shortcomings. They did this, they did that. But never have I felt unloved. And as a result, also, I am loving and I am able to love. And it's not difficult for me. And so, as I said, I became very emotional when I had this thought that the ultimate thing they, my parents g gave me and that they never compromised or failed on ever is this, giving me love. And I had never thought about it. I always thought, oh, I wish my parents forced me to wake up at five and, and, and go for a run so that I would be more disciplined, more athletic, more stoic. I wish this, I wish that. You know, I always thought about these negatives. And I never, and I, I did think about the positives. They, they are creative. They encouraged me to be an artist and to take risks. But I thought to myself, I'm a waiter right now. You know, it didn't, as of yet, I can't really appreciate it because it hasn't panned out. It hasn't resulted in anything significant. But love and this infinite, these infinite amounts of love that they've both given me has resulted in me being the way I am and having no problem loving and understanding it and having this foundation that I am very grateful for. And I feel like, and so that's something you can't ever get back. If your parents didn't do that for you, if you felt neglected in that way and unloved, that's something you can never get back. As a child, you are extremely malleable. Tiny things affect you. I know I've been affected and we all know because we, we've all had, in, in, in hindsight, tiny things that happen to us that have shaped us. Everyone, when you're a kid, you're extremely malleable. The tiniest thing has the, can have an enormous impact. If you are unloved as a kid, that's something you can never get back. You can never correct. You can correct the rest and you can appreciate the other things that your parents might give you. But being loved is something you can never get back if you don't get it. And it's something that they never, once again, they never, never failed at. They were always extremely loving from the day I was born to today. And so I'm realizing now that I have this, I do have this strong foundation because discipline, Hard work 
exercising, healthy diet, not taking drugs, just the myriad of things that are important to me to keep your life in order and to be the best person you can be. I can work on those things. I am working on those things. There weren't, some of those things were not instilled in me when I was growing up because scoop of the day, my parents are not perfect. But they might be some of the greatest parents to ever live because that foundation of being loved, which you can never get back, they never failed at. They absolutely provided me with it uncompromisingly. I, I, I can't stop speaking about it because I'm really coming to that realization truly now as I keep talking about it, this idea that if you are unloved as a kid, you can never repair that. You can work on it, I suppose. Maybe, in, in a way, repair it. But it's... I don't think you can repair it because, as I said, when you're a kid, you are extremely different from when you are an adult. We all know that, for example, your brain, I think, solidifies, so to speak, at 23. When when you're growing up, you're literally physically malleable. You're, you're the way your brain, everything, you're you're absorbing things and you're putting things into place that will stay the same for the rest of your life. So if you're unloved as a kid, that becomes a part of you that can never be corrected. You, if you're loved as an adult, it's not going to repair the foundational damage. So I'm realizing now, I've said it before, I'll just say it again, that I do not have this flaw in me. I, don't, I do not have this, this damage in my foundation that people... Successful people, artists, celebrities try their whole life to cover up by talking about their pain, by being the best at what they do. I do believe in this idea that if you don't have this foundation of being loved, then successful people then you're driven to have success to kind of repair that and to... I mean, those are all psycho psychological concepts and ideas that I have no idea about, but I think it makes sense that if you don't have that, then you're trying your whole life to get your parents' approval, to be the best so that you can feel worthy in a way, just generally worthy if you weren't given that love when you were a kid. And so that that gets glorified because the most driven people you know all have this negative past where they've been hurt things of that nature have happened and I don't have that maybe that's my flaw maybe that's why maybe that's why I'm struggling so much is that I don't well I definitely feel like I, I want to make my parents proud and be worthy of what they've given me but in no way do I feel like I have to make up for being unloved once again I didn't articulate this idea very well because I'm just improvising here but it doesn't really matter it doesn't really matter because I just came to the realization that my parents have given me this un invaluable head start oh it's nice it is nice. Life is good. I guess, last thing. Very personal. I started watching porn when I was 13. Porn is extremely negative. And one thing that, one idea that people talk about when they talk about porn is that it's an addiction. And like all addictions, you keep wanting to push the envelope further. You, you're never satisfied. You keep wanting more. Now, what does it mean in the context of porn? More extreme things. More crazy things. Things, really disgusting things. And through experiencing sex in that way, since I was 13, I'm realizing now that I am in a relationship that I don't know. I don't know who I am in terms of my sexual side. I don't know what I like. I know what I think I like because I've masturbated to it in the past, right? But why was I actually masturbating to it? Because I liked it or because I was completely lost and confused 
and had no control over myself and was addicted and pushing things further because it made me believe that those things that I was watching were the things that I wanted out of life, out of, uh, out of my sexual, out of my sexual interactions. If I'm watching it, surely it means that's the type of person I am. That's the type of things that things I like. And I actually had this talk with Ty telling her that she had made a suggestion. She, we were talking about sexual preferences, I suppose. And I, I realized that I can't tell you that I like this or that. I can tell you that I've watched it and thought I liked it. But now that I have a real human being in front of me and that I am you know, a few months removed from this addiction, I can't honestly tell you what I like. Through experiencing it, I can understand that I like it. But beforehand, I can tell you, oh, I like this thing, this thing that I watched, right? Surely I like it because I watched it and had an orgasm to it. But then I think, no, actually, it's disgusting. I don't like it. I don't want that in my life. I don't think it's good in any way. I don't think it turns me on. Somehow, when you're in front of a screen and you're in this desperate mode, it I don't even know what turns you on, really. I don't even know if you're turned on by it or if you're just fucked up and you don't even know what's happening. But when you are in a real situation, right, it's like you're a different person or it's like that person was a different version of me. So, just a reminder that porn is extremely negative. There are no, no upsides to it and it's disgusting. It should be avoided at all costs. It's, it's a weird thing to realize, oh, I don't know, it's like if, I mean, it's the it's, it's same with food. You eat junk food, it doesn't taste good. It doesn't actually taste good. It tastes like shit. You can, if you take a step back, you don't like that Big Mac. You don't like that thing. You think you like it because you're so used to eating shit. But it tastes awful. The texture, everything is awful about it. Everything. And you might say, no, it, it actually they, 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 they design these things to taste good. They design these things to taste good to fucked up people. If you had never been exposed to these things and you ate a diet from your birth, a diet that was supposed to make you, to, to keep you in the best health possible, that had all the nutrients and blah, blah, blah that you needed. And then one day you happened upon a, upon a Big Mac or just any junk food, you'd think, this is horrifying, this is disgusting, it's like eating poison. You've been so used to it that you think it tastes good. You can't even really taste it, most likely. I know when I'm addicted to chocolate and I eat, and I used to eat those 200 grams chocolate bars every day, and then I stopped and I ate one, I think, it tastes disgusting, it's horrible. So, fuck, I don't remember the point I was trying to make when I said this. I suppose we're going back to this idea of fucking up reality. If your reality is misshapen and distorted and that's the reality you live inside of, then that's the reality you live inside of. But if you progressively pull yourself out of it, you realize that you were lying to yourself. Going back to this idea of lying, it's not just saying something that's untrue. It's in your behavior. If you eat junk food regularly, if that's part of your diet, then you are lying to yourself because it doesn't taste good and it doesn't make you feel good. So you're lying to yourself. And if, if you're lying to yourself, you are living in a false reality. If you're lying to yourself, telling yourself that you love that person that you're with, when in reality you just feel dependent and actually you can't stand them, right? You're living in, you're not living in the optimal reality. It's difficult to accept that, but you're not living in, you're not living your life to the fullest. If you're eating a bad diet, it's the same. If you're not exercising, it's the same. You're just, you're just so used to, what's the word? Oh, I had the word to, ah, come on, come on, come on, find the word. If you want to find the word, the word slips out. 
But you're so, so used to shaping your reality in this way that is false that anything that fits within that narrative that you've created, you're able to convince yourself that it's right. But so, I guess the, the bigger point to all these ideas of you should exercise, you should eat, eat good, you shouldn't lie, is that all these ills, these negative things, even porn addiction, stem from self-deceit. If you're not exercising, you're lying to yourself in a way. Because in your, let's stay hippie, hippie-ish, in your soul, you do know that that food is bad for you. You do know that not exercising is bad for you. You've just been pushed away from your true self so far that you can't feel that it's wrong. That is what I believe. So that's why I'm saying, you know, get a six pack in six weeks is not the answer because you're actually trying to reshape your reality and who you are. That's what you're trying to do. If you're trying to change your diet, you're not trying to stop eating Big Macs. You're, you're trying to come to the realization that when you're eating a Big Mac, you're slowly killing yourself and you are living in a false reality that doesn't benefit you in, in the long run. All right. Man, I thought I had a lot of notes. I didn't really have that many notes. <sighs> well, I'm hungry. So thank you for listening. I wish you the best. And goodbye. Oh, and also... No. No. I don't know. I had this funny idea recently. Another progression of the talking to camera thing. I want to do skits. The idea of being a comedian fascinates me because it's one of those things. A lot of people think Joe Rogan loves talking about how, oh, you think you can be a comedian? Oh, I really think you just need to tell Joe you think it's easy. Nothing is more difficult than being a comedian, which is counterintuitive because everyone can be a comedian. Everyone you know has at one point been a comedian. It might have been for one minute, two minutes, but everyone has this ability Maybe when they're drunk, of course, that, that might help. But everyone has this ability to be funny. We all do. Everyone you know at some point has been a comedian, maybe for five seconds, right? So it seems like everyone can be a comedian. Obviously, it's a craft, it's a job, it's a career, it takes work, blah, blah, blah. But I would, I believe, I know it's a funny, weird idea, but I think that comedy is the highest form of art. The highest art can aspire to is to be funny. Now, it doesn't mean to be exclusively funny, right? It doesn't mean that it's only funny. But it means that, to me, when I look at the greatest pieces of art, in my opinion, there's something inherently funny about them. I don't know why, but that's, that's something I believe. And so I do believe that the highest form of art, I used to think it was music, but I think on top of music is art. What did I just say? I think on top of music. Ooh, I just listened to myself and corrected myself here. So I'm not going to be pissed off when I watch this. On top of music, I think it's humor. Comedy. And possibly my favorite comedian is Norm MacDonald. And so my idea is to record myself, right? Which would be an alternative version of what I'm doing here. Recording myself in a different setting. Improvising, trying to make a joke. It seems extremely scary. Now I could tell myself, okay, I need to go to an open mic, right? And jump too many steps. No, I'm going to record myself by myself first. And I'm going to try to improvise a comedy skit. To me, that seems like an interesting idea. And if you watched this and any other episodes, there's probably no part of you that thinks, oh, this guy should be a comedian, right? But... I'm going to do it because one, it, one, it's challenging. And two, 
I believe that comedy is the highest art form. So I guess I have to give it a go. It seems like an interesting idea. So I have a whole plan on how I want to present it and, and film it and blah, blah, blah. But I, I look at Norm McDonald's jokes. There's something so intriguing about the way they work. So I'd love to try to just improvise, ramble, and try to make a joke. And obviously fail a million times and look ridiculous and pathetic. Especially the first time. But that's an exercise that I want to practice. I don't know why, but it seems like something I should do. So I'm saying this, you, you're probably never, you're probably not going to see any of this until a long time, if ever. But I want to try this new exercise. Because it just seems hopeless and, 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 and impossible. And one, one, once again, it would be a practice of talking to camera in a different setting where I would be less comfortable. My goal would be to be funny, right? Here my goal is just to say what I have to say and to ideally be somewhat articulate, more articulate every time. But the goal would be to be funny at the end of the day. So I would have this specific goal. It would be improvised. And... Don't remember the other end. So the goal would be to be funny, unlike here. The setting would be different, so it would be uncomfortable at first. I'm sure there's other things. I'm, I'm just hungry. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Wish you the best.